Thank you. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is Abe no Atsuko, um, but uh, I go by Obe, uh, Obe, uh -huh, Abe Shonagon. Um, words are hard today, uh, a lot. <laughs> and and as I'm sure many of you have noticed, if you are uh, also uh, studying Japanese things, uh, it's really easy to <laughs> put between the two. Um, Abe Shonagon is the uh, title that I go by, usually. Um, but I I am like 0% messed up if anybody's like, you know, what, whatever, <laughs> whatever comes up. Uh, I have a very close friend of mine who's like, uh, 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 Becky and my Christian tongue. And I, and I get it. Uh, although we have definitely worked on, worked on uh, getting him comfortable with pronouncing things in Japanese. Uh, and, and really that is, that is kind of the sum total of what my class here is today. Um, I have been doing a Japanese persona full-time in the SCA since 2006 when I first joined. When I first joined, I was really lucky that I, uh, joined an Onsteora in the, uh, Canton of Skargard at the time. Uh, and when, when the SCA was introduced to me, they they just said you can be any persona you want to be pre sixteen hundred, uh, and so I was really lucky that I didn't have any any like preconceived notions coming in, and so I felt really free to choose Japanese. And I know that 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 journey is not going to be the same for everybody. Like I've over the years, I've heard lots of horror stories about how people have been discriminated against because they weren't. Uh, portraying a Western European persona. Um, and I've been extremely lucky in that, like, I kind of never really ran into that. Uh, and, and so if, if you have, like, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, hopefully by the end of this class, like, we'll, we'll have, uh, some, some tools for, for dealing with that. And, uh, and, and like, maybe, maybe some built up camaraderie too. Uh, because, being a persona that not very many people are, uh, I understand, can be kind of lonely uh, at times because, you know, you you have to make everything. Like, you're on the hook for everything. Um, you kind of become an ambassador whether you wanted to or not. And sometimes whether you have the spoons or not. Like, if if you are at a, at a function in full like far eastern garb you know people are going to ask questions and they're going to want to know what's this why did you do this uh if they ask at all and and sometimes you know that there is unfortunately some events where some people will just be ugly and um and hopefully that doesn't push you out of the sca i i know that it has pushed some people out and um i kind of mourn that loss uh as I'm sure many of the Far East personas do. Um, but, but, you know, if it hasn't, if you're like, you, you know, stick with it, like you, you do kind of end up being, being the ambassador for this culture uh, or in any of the Far Eastern cultures I've noticed. Um, so when I, when I started this journey, when I was, when I was at my first event that I was really thinking about what persona I wanted to be and decided we're going to do Japanese. Uh, I had friends with me. And I, th I think also that was like a big key factor in m my success in the SEA was I had, I had some people who were starting out brand new, just like I was. And we, we were all on the same page. We're all going to do Japanese and we all start researching and we had different interests and so somebody would research shoes and I would I was researching how kimono were constructed and like there was just like this kind of round table um and I understand that not everybody has that uh thankfully the internet has really I felt like helped build that community for a lot of uh SCA per like Far Eastern personas uh like I, I found the Tausando message boards uh, and the Sengoku Daimyo website that uh, AJ Bryant had set up, and that you know that was 
such a lifesaver being a you know a baby skadian also i feel like starting on hard mode and because uh, at the time i was surrounded by a whole bunch of people doing viking like a whole bunch of people doing viking so i was like the one little like lone like i'm here in kimono um uh, person and uh it it was very embarrassing in the beginning because like i didn't know how to sew i didn't know as much about japan and its history as i feel like i probably needed to when i decided to do japanese persona as my main persona but but like i i was all in at the time and uh and yes those those websites and those online communities really kind of i felt like helped save me from making some big blunders and so that's kind of my segue into into how this has gone terribly terribly wrong for me before and how this has gone beautifully right for me i am not a japanese person i do not come from any kind of japanese descent all of my ancestors are Euro mutt. Um, and so me as a person not from this culture, I felt like I had to know everything before I started. And I'm, I'm not saying that that is like totally a right mindset because like, you know, it's a growing process. It's a lot. It's a whole lot to start in the SEA. It's a whole lot of buy-in and time and money to to just get to your first event. Um, and it can be hard. Uh, but I I felt like I had to go like the 12 extra miles to know every everything. And I think in the long run, that kind of is the core of it. Because coming into and portraying a culture that is not your own um you're a guest in their house like that that's the best metaphor i can mean. you're a guest in their house and there's a certain level of respect that you kind of always want to show and and i'm not saying you don't show that same respect if you are portraying a persona from your own culture like if if i were to go do a, a germanic persona like there's still there's still some respect there because like these these were people just like you know just like us they just happen to have been gone for a while um but but when you're a guest in these people's house you want to know you want to know their manners you want to know like how how we feel about life the universe and everything so that we maybe don't don't say something or do something that would accidentally uh be like really offensive or hurt somebody's feelings um and when when those happen when those missteps happen when you when you do say something or when you do show something that uh could be kind of like hurtful or offensive you know apologizing and and moving past that and doing better is is really what we've got um my my worst offense to date is I had not fully researched the red obi, the red tra traveling obi that women wear, uh, and that has some religious connotations, and I've stopped wearing it. Uh, thankfully, thankfully nobody nobody was hurt by that. Um, but but like I, since I'm not a practicing Buddhist or Shintoist, I I I don't touch that. I don't wear that. Um, and. Uh, I also am not afraid to admit that. I'm not afraid to tell people, oh yeah, if you look at older pictures of me that are still up on Facebook, like I, I will let people know. I've stopped wearing that. It has like when when they ask, like it has these religious connotations, like the red and red is like the I've gone through some purity rituals and, and I don't practice that, so I don't do that. Um I do understand that if you want to do this Japanese persona and you decide you you want to portray what this person would look like if they had that that is like a whole personal personal journey for you uh and and i think if if you were 
comfortable with that if you've done the research and you can like really talk intelligently on it and like let let people know like this is what this would be like I, I don't think anybody actually has a problem with it I just know that I don't feel comfortable doing that um so so again I think I think that's probably part of that personal journey uh Things that have gone like really, really beautifully right for me though. Um, mundanely, I am a ceramics instructor. I taught ceramics at the University of Memphis and Christian Brothers University. And I have on occasion exchange students that come into my classroom. And um, the, the joy on their adorable faces when, when they see that touch of home, that bit of their past here in America where they didn't expect to see it with like the instructor who's like a weirdo putting hymns on kimonos two weeks before Gulf Wars is uh, <laughs> like really, really precious to me that, that I for a minute got to help kind of cut down that bit of homesickness that they were feeling like, because like you, you can tell when they come up and they're, they're like talking to you about it and you can talk to them about it. And, and you can see that for a brief moment, um, they aren't quite as homesick as they normally are in your classroom. Like for me, that's been, that's been absolutely beautiful. Uh, and, uh, recently, um, because of that mundane job, I've been researching Korean culture and Korean garb and uh, Korean ceramic pro or practices. And, and I've had those same interactions with some of my Korean students where, where like for that brief moment, they're like, oh my gosh, like you, you know about my history. You, you like, you wear Hombok, like, like the excitement and joy and like that little, little bit of not feeling quite as homesick because you've got that familiar, like that that piece of your past and your history there um, has been really special to me. Um, but to get here, to get to that point, it was researching everything to death. Like I have researched everything. Like I cannot tell you how many times I've sat and watched the uh, Jidai Matsuri parade to watch how women walk in all this <laughs> or, or how they carry themselves. Um, I do understand that as a Japanese persona, I'm a little bit spoiled because everything got recorded. Like, and, and so like, there's, there's all these diaries and histories and like court writings that we can pull information from so that we know, uh, and we don't have to guess. Um, but, but I do feel like in the things that I do kind of have to guess where I'm like, that I can't, I can't lay hands on some research. It's definitely not been translated, uh, and my translation skills aren't up to the task. Like I, I just approach it um, really respectfully, and uh, that has really served me well uh, with this. Um, I've never, I've never had an encounter with a person of Japanese or Korean background who has ever. Um, been like really hurt or upset by now I do I do totally also understand like that's not a metric for success really because like you know these are people from like extremely po polite societies where if they were upset they probably wouldn't say anything but but my interactions with people about these personas about portraying something from their culture um you you can kind of still still tell like there, there's there's none of that discomfort or that like weird like aura from any from anybody um so like I, I feel like it's it's been really positive but you know fingers crossed that hopefully they weren't just just being polite because they are polite people um but but i do i do try to keep a finger on that pulse i do try to see you know like where are we where are we at with this like am am i still portraying this correctly? Am I still wearing all this correctly? Um, one of the biggest things I try to caution new Japanese personas against is 
the half and half where you've got some of your Japanese garb, but you need a belt or something and you put a Western European belt on. Like I really, really caution people against doing that. Um, there's, there's also, I, I don't want to call it an issue. I don't, I don't think it's like an issue issue, but some Japanese men's garb from period, the, uh, tie on the hakama are white and in the sca white belts are a protected thing knights wear those um i have never made that garb for myself because i've never wanted to have a conversation with somebody from japan or from a japanese descent where i said yes in period that tie would be white but i changed it because our western european organization wouldn't like that tie to be what because I'm not a knight. Um I like I've, I've never wanted to have that conversation with them where I was like, yeah, I I changed this about the the historical look of this garb to fit this other. Um I do understand that there are people who do do that who will just change the tie color and it's not that big of a deal for them. Um like zero hate there. Like you do you you totally do you. Um but but for me like I couldn't. And and I think I think that's probably also like a large part of this is like what are what are you comfortable with? Are are you comfortable having that conversation with somebody? Because I mean, you know, I there's there's no religious that I'm aware of. There's no religious significance to that tie being white and there's no mm, specific meaning that i found that doesn't mean that research doesn't exist um there's just i don't think it is a problem to change that color i just know that i don't want to have that conversation <laughs> with anybody <laughs> ever um but if you if you do if you are comfortable like do it uh because like it is also some really beautiful garb and um I do, I do enjoy seeing people uh, out running around in it in the wild. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, but um, circling back around, I, I really, I would honestly rather see somebody throw on a tea tunic and some pants and be like general SCA chic then try to do these half and half things where I've got most of this Japanese garb and then I've got like all this Western European stuff on, on top of it. Um, I, I know my preferences, you know, about as far as you can throw them, but, um, but I do think that when, when we are choosing to do a far Eastern persona in the SCA, it is a little bit of a disservice to not then research the period, in, in my case for this, the period Japanese solution for I need a belt to hang things off of. Like, what, what did they do? Uh, and, you know, I totally get when you are at an event and you're like, I need this thing right now, or like I'm having a, a guard malfunction right now. I, I totally get, like, sometimes you just have to put the leather belt on. Like, you know, um, but, but, like, I, I do caution new Japanese personas against falling into falling into that where you're like oh I've got this like Viking bag that I just always wear because like a friend gave it to me um and and that's again you know that's that's a really nitpicky thing and I and I do totally understand you know people give you things they don't know what to give you usually and so you'll get a lot of like Western European things or a lot of like the SCA chic things that like you know everybody has um and it's hard to it's hard to not use those gifts because you, you know you, you know somebody like thought about you and gave you a thing and like it's really precious to you um but i do still feel like there are ways that that can be found to use the precious thing but still keep the japanese accoutrement um and, and and I I also do get it like you know if you've got a brand new person they really want to do Japanese and you want to get them in Japanese garb as soon as possible so they can get out get out there and have fun and it's the ten foot rule where do I look 
you know, presentable from 10 feet. Like, do I look, I do totally get that, but I do, I do still throw that caution, like that word of caution out there. Like just research everything. Don't, don't halfway uh, anything because like, again, whether, whether you intend it or not, whether you have the spoons for it or not, you do end up kind of being that ambassador. Um, and while it is not your job to educate the entire world, we are in this educational organization <laughs> where we are teaching everybody about these different medieval things. Uh, and, and so a little bit, I'm also, <laughs> also want you to know, you, you may have to plan your spoons around that. You, you may just have to, have to come to terms with that that is your life when you choose a far eastern persona um and then another thing that i will caution new far eastern persona people against is leaving things off that wouldn't be left off and my biggest example is when i'm wearing korean men's garb hats you didn't leave the house without certain hats or certain head, but like it didn't happen. Neo-Confucianism would have like rolled over in its grave and had kittens if you left the house without any of that. Um, and I'll tell people, yes, if the whole rest of this garb looks cool and you love it and it looks comfortable because it is, you're going to have to wear the hats and there's no, there's no getting around that. You, you don't, you don't do it. Um, a Korean person will find you and tell you about it. Um, you just know if if you're like, I can't, I can't do the hats. Do do Korean from a different time period where it wasn't like because I'm talking very specifically about like Choson, like late period, late, late period Korean. Find find something that you can totally be comfortable with that you don't mind wearing the whole thing for. Um because, because yeah. Don't run into that. Do not run into that. Um, early, early in my Japanese persona career, I went around an event in just my Nagabakuma and a Sode. And uh, a friend of mine showed her Japanese co-worker my pictures from that event. And she was real polite about it, but she did let my friend know women wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been seen in public like that. And like, this is like a modern lady, like a modern lady who, you know, has like probably as much uh, knowledge about history, <laughs> you know, your average Joe off the street. And she, she was just like, you know, that, that wouldn't have happened. Right. So I was like, you know, that was kind of a wake up call to like little baby me that I'm like, Oh, I, this is for real. Like this is for real. Um, and and that that did change <laughs> how I approach things. Like if it gets a certain temperature at events, uh, you know, like I I learned what that fabric would look like. Uh, I made myself some summer garb, um, and you know, honestly, uh, even even with the umpteen gajillion kimono, when you make them right and you've got like the detached sleeves at the bottom, uh, you can you can still stay pretty cool. Uh, so it's, it's like finding hemp cloth though. Let me tell you, like that's, <laughs> um, I, I did use linen for a lot of these like super duper under because like finding hemp cloth is expensive when you do. It's not great. Um, but, but yeah, finding, finding that, like what did Japanese people in the 12th century do in the hot summertime? Uh, like really, really was the solution to me just wanting to like strip down to my underwear. Um, uh, <laughs> now, th those of you who do know what the solution for <laughs> the hot weather in the 12th century was, uh, I, I haven't, I haven't gotten brave enough to go topless with that like really thin kimono yet. Like I should have switched to my Korean. <laughs> but, but if you ever are, if you're like, I'm just gonna wear pasties, I'm gonna go for it. Send me pictures because I want. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> like, I, I imagine one of us will be brave enough one day. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs>
I just want um, to know that we have five minutes until the top of the hour. So if, and there is the class that was coming after this one uh, to let all the rest of the students know has been canceled. So feel free to stay in the room and chat. But if anybody has an 11 o'clock class that they wanted to go to, this is your five minutes one. Actually, we can open that up because I'm getting to the point where I'm just like rambling now. Right. So if anybody has questions. Feel free to unmute and ask questions if you feel comfortable. If not, we can stop the recording and then we can have open discussion uh, that way. Or if there's no question. I will go ahead and stop the recording in case anybody wants to chit chat afterwards. 